Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, Mr. Pinto, actually, uh, Stanley Pinto, Mr. Stanley Pinto spoke of Irina having coined and brought in the crowd. I must plead guilty to that charge. It's not Irina who brought in owners, editors, and the crowd. It was I who brought that in. This draws from really something which I don't know how many of you are aware of. This is from a very famous cricket book published in the 1970s called Players, Patrons, and the Crowd. It's one of the stellar books on cricket. And it's from here that I've drawn the title for this little talk here. All of us have our fantasies, our ultimate innermost wet dreams. It's almost like that rupees 15 lakh that somebody promised to deposit in our accounts. You know, it's one of those wet dreams, one of those fantasies. And for most of us in the media business, this fantasy this innermost wet dream for all of us is the prospect of working for the ideal newspaper or the <coughs> ideal TV news channel or the <coughs> ideal news website. And I'm sure for almost all of you here, there is in your mind the conception of an ideal newspaper. And when we say ideal newspaper, we really are generically talking of a media product. It could be a newspaper, it could be a TV station, it could be a website. But all of us are really in our minds having this conception of an ideal newspaper. Or as those very many people who are trying to impose Hindi upon us these days would say, we all have our idea of an Adarsh newspaper a newspaper that is independent of the government, a newspaper that covers everything that is important to you, a newspaper that is responsive to your tastes and interests, a newspaper that is a forum for people of all or many backgrounds, a newspaper that is the voice of the poor and the lower classes, a newspaper that wants to improve your city to spend more on infrastructure, to spend more on roads and sanitation, a newspaper that wants a bigger role for women, a newspaper that talks peace, not war, maybe a liberal and progressive newspaper that spotlights the subalterns and wants reforms, a newspaper that exposes corruption, fraud, malfeasance, a newspaper that shows the servants, the so-called sevaks, and what they are doing with public expenses. So all of us have this conception of an ideal newspaper in some form or the other. It could be in English, Hindi, Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, in any language. But all of us in our minds deeply value the idea of an ideal news product. Such a newspaper, which is free, which is fair, which is fearless, which is also possibly fun, may seem impossible to exist in today's India. And if you listen to Mr. Stanley Pinto, you would think it will not happen at all. But such a paper might seem impossible to exist in today's India. It might almost seem like, sorry to say this, almost seem like a chedin, you know, unlikely to happen, <laughs> unlikely to happen. But wait, but wait, because there was such a newspaper. There was such a newspaper. It was India's first newspaper. It was actually Asia's first newspaper. It was published 237 years ago from Calcutta in 1781. And it was this newspaper. It was called Hickey's Bengal Gazette. Hickey's Bengal Gazette was the name of the newspaper. 
James Augustus Hickey. James Augustus Hickey was an Irishman in British India. He was its owner and editor. Owners, editors, and the crown. Mr. Hickey was both owner and editor. India, in fact, he was India's first owner editor and printer and publisher, James Augustus Hickey. This was Hickey's Bengal Gazette. This is the newspaper he tried to create for you. He was a man who looked at India and looked at Indians as noble savages. This was a man who became the voice of the Bengali poor and the lower class. This was the man who, who actually in his newspaper in 1780 and 81 spoke of greater investments on roads in Calcutta. This was the man who spoke of greater investment in sanitation in Calcutta in 1780-81. This was the man who did all of these things. Swara Bhaskar, does Swara Bhaskar ring a bell in your minds? Swara Bhaskar was an actress, the daughter of Commodore Uday Bhaskar, who actually made headline news in 2018 because of a scene in a movie called Padmavat. Or was it Padmavat? What was the movie? Whatever, she, she, in some movie in which she, she was in a masturbatory act. In 1780, 1780, in the others newspaper of that time, Hickey batted for female masturbation. In 1780, in 2018, India is squabbling about whether women can masturbate or not. In 1780, James Augustus Hickey produced a newspaper which he started out thinking would be a neutral newspaper, a newspaper where we thought he would not give space to politics, a newspaper where we thought he would, give, he would just be doing the normal thing. Hickey did all of these things. He exposed corruption in the uh, East India Company. He exposed corruption in the <coughs> church, batted for women, batted for the subaltern, for the lower classes, for, the, for actually the poor, the Bengali poor in the East India Company, batted for the extremely underprivileged in the British Army who were serving in India. So he did all of these things, and he eventually turned anti-war. So when we talk of an ideal newspaper, Hickey conformed to almost click every box that we can think of. He was pro-poor, pro-marginalized, pro, -poor, pro, -poor, pro pro-women, anti-war, exposed corruption, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Readers loved this newspaper. Readers loved this newspaper. Hickey was a man who had a printing background. He had a printing background, and when the opportunity presented itself, he started a newspaper, and this was Hickey's gazette. He expanded the business in a manner of speaking when the opportunity presented itself. Hickey had a printing press, so he thought a newspaper was, in the, in the language of today's media managers, a natural fit. So a printing guy gets into a newspaper. Initially, Hickey wanted his newspaper. It was a four-page weekly newspaper. He wanted his newspaper to be neutral. He didn't want to cover politics, but his subaltern Irish past caught up with him. He became what today's BJP might call an urban Naxal. <laughs> he took up the kind of issues urban Naxals take up, today's urban Naxals. And as you can see, I, you know where I come from. So he saw, saw Indians as uh, noble savages, spoke on sanitation, spoke on roads, spoke on fires, spoke on promotions in the army, spoke on the war, spoke against the war, spoke against corruption, exposed corruption, exposed the church, and so on and so forth. The weekly newspaper became a super hit. And we are talking of just a two year time frame. It also became a thorn in the flesh of the East India Company. So the rich and the powerful local elite in Calcutta, the Amit Shahs and the Ram Mothers of that time, <laughs> 
the local and rich elite of that city sat down to see what they could do to temper the criticism of Hickey. Arun Shauri calls this headline management. And it is headline management. So what the local elite did, because back then editors and owners could not, could actually safely take a morning walk, because editors and owners could take a safe morning walk, what the local elite then did was to prop up a rival newspaper. Because the ultimate option of a morning walk was not available. So 10 months after Hickey's Bengal Gazette began sending out notifications in 1781, another newspaper called the India Gazette opened on the App Store in Calcutta. This was that newspaper. Unlike Hickey, who came with a printing background, the owners of this newspaper had no background in the media business. Bernard Messink, one of the guys who put up this newspaper, was a theater person. Peter Reed, the other man who started this newspaper, was a trader in salt. Salt. And unlike Hickey's Bengal Gazette, <coughs> the India Gazette was convinced of the superiority of the British. Hickey saw Indians as noble savages. India Gazette saw, them, uh, saw the British as being superior to Indians. Hickey spoke of the poor and the marginalized. This new newspaper became a megaphone of the rich and the upper class. Hickey picked up every issue that was prickly this was a newspaper that did not touch anything to do with politics. It did not take on the East India Company. It did not expose corruption. It actually did not even support the freedom of the press or the freedom of speech. And it ran bigoted articles in 1781 against Islam. Readers loved the Hickey's Gazette. Advertisers loved the India Gazette. And just like, just quite unlike Hickey's Gazette, this was a newspaper that was dull and dry. It spoke of British superiority. It was bigoted against Islam and said Muslims must be watched carefully during religious festivals. Look at how identical the discourse is to today's India. Be careful of Muslims, especially during their festivals. It did not print a single article against the company or against the man who later became the Governor General of India, Warren Hastings, who was then the head of the East India Company in India. It did not print a single article that supported freedom of the press or freedom of speech. It became, in a manner of speaking, the company's mouthpiece, the East India Company's mouthpiece. The company's ads flooded the newspaper. Look at how identical it is to today's India. Because the publication is carrying out what the East India Company wants, the East India <coughs> Company floods it with ads. Retailers flood the newspaper with ads because they think that the, news, the, the new newspaper is reaching wealthier local retailers, uh, residents, and so on and so forth. So essentially, what we are seeing here is a counterpoising of of two newspapers, the Bengal Gazette and the India Gazette, both of which take contrary positions. In fact, the India Gazette attacked Hickey's advocacy of the freedom of the press. It, you know, it attacked the freedom of the press that Hickey was batting for. The then right-wing trolls swung into action in 1780, in the 18th century. Quote, I am shocked to observe the constant endeavors of malcontents. Look at the word malcontents. I'm shocked to observe the constant endeavors of malcontents to effect a total subversion of peace and harmony amongst us, <coughs> wrote the Mohandas Pai of that time. <laughs> freedom of the press is often, again, quote unquote, Freedom of the press is often converted into a destructive engine of public oppression and private wrong. 
Freedom of the press is often converted into a destructive engine of public oppression and private wrong, wrote the Vivek Agnihotri of that time. <coughs> Hickey felt that corrupt officials had propped up the new newspaper because he had refused to pay a bribe. There were other forms of pressure that Hickey was constantly subjected to. The India Gazette had the backing of the East India Company. It was licensed to post its newspaper free of charge through the post office, a bit like today's Tata Sky carriage fee. <laughs> it was licensed to post without paying a fee. The Supreme Council of the East India Company hit back at Hickey's Gazette from using the post office. Then as now, hell hath no fury like an owner scorned. Hell hath no fury like an owner editor scorned. And so therefore, Hickey said this, a governor who wishes to silence the press may properly be compared to those tyrants who put out the eyes of their slaves that they more cheerfully can turn a millstone. So you're seeing a blowback from James Hickey. He also says this, the weakest, the meanest, the most cowardly souls are ever the most cruel and revengeful. Cruelty is the vice of cowards only, tweeted Hickey at that time. Once Hickey wanted to be a new, neutral newspaper, a public service. Now he viewed himself as a defender of public rights because his newspaper had been attacked, his newspaper had been economically boycotted because his newspaper had been essentially debarred from the public discourse. He created a hashtag then called Mera Governor General Chorha. Of course, it rings a bell. It must ring a bell. Mera Governor General Chorhe was the hashtag James Hickey created and began, in, began exposing the corruption in the East India Company. 1780, please keep this date in mind. Warren Hastings, who was then the chief of the East India Company, who then went on to become the Governor General of India, had given an army contract to a company called Charles Crofts a company called Charles Crofts, a company with powerful friends in Britain. The governor general, hashtag Mera Gigi Chorhe, <laughs> the governor general did this without a bidding process. Please observe the parallels. Without a bidding process. Again, please observe. The contract which was earlier worth rupees 390,000 went because of the largest of Mr. Warren Hastings for 996,000 rupees. Three times. The figure three times figures everywhere. Mera ji ji chor hai. The food of the soldiers of the East India Company saw a 30% jump. A 30% jump because Warren Hastings gave this contract to a company called Charles Croft. Each, the price of each bullock, the price of each bullock, and I'm not kidding you, the price of each bullock under this new contract awarded by the Governor General was doubled. James Hickey took all these on. This is virtually the Rafael deal of that time. <laughs> this is virtually the Rafael deal of that time. An aircraft is bought for more than the price it is uh, it was earlier bought for. The price is nearly doubled, more than three times or five times. Similarly, Hastings gave out a contract to repair a river, river embankment to a man called Archie Archibald Fraser. The old contractor was paid 25,000 rupees a year. Under the new dispensation, hashtag Merajiji Chorhe, Fraser got 90,000 rupees per year. So this is the corruption that James Hickey used this newspaper for. And eventually, he committed the ultimate mistake, which is he called Warren Hastings Clive's 
miserable successor. Clive's miserable successor, Robert Clive. For this, the government of the time, the East India Company, took him to court. He was pronounced not guilty. He was pronounced not guilty. James Hickey, hashtag mera Gigi chor hai, James Hickey had also called Hastings a despot. All these words will ring a bell, and I hope they ring a bell. James Hickey called Hastings a despot. And on that charge, Hickey was pronounced guilty. He was sentenced to 12 months in jail and two and a half thousand rupees as fine. Hastings sued again. He sued him four more times and then sued him twice more. 1780, we are talking about seven or nine cases against one man. Thank you. His press and typefaces were seized. His home and shop were raided. His clothes and furniture were taken away, James Hickey's. His belongings were auctioned for 1 16th their value. Hickey's Bengal Gazette was dead within 16 months of starting because of all of these actions of the East India Company. All these wonderful details from have come from a first class book just out called The Untold Stories of India's First Newspaper by a man called Andrew Otis. And it is with Andrew Otis's permission that I'm using all of these information, at least some of this information, and he sends his regards to you. So Andrew Otis is a young man, a great scholar, who's just done this fine book on, on Hickey's Gazette, and it's required reading for any of us who are citizens of India because of what it tells you about contemporary India 237 years later. Hickey was jailed, but he began a campaign. Hastings was recalled, and this I say because of the power of the press. Warren Hastings succeeds in putting James Hickey in jail. But from jail, Hickey continues his campaign. Warren Hastings is recalled to London and impeached. But the spirit of the press doesn't end with the killing of a newspaper. It goes on. Two of Hickey's assistants started the Calcutta Morning Post and the Bengal Journal. Between 1828 and 35, there were 16 Bengali new publications that were launched, including one by Raja Ram Mohan Rai, which became a stellar publication. And I tell you the story of James Hickey because it's such a magnificent story of interference, intimidation, censorship, litigation, probably even physical elimination all of which actually are so much in the minds of media and media persons today as we speak. I narrate this extraordinary story in detail for three reasons. Firstly, to draw your attention to something you may or may not have known. Secondly, to tell you that the impulses of the press, the impulses of the people in power, and the impulses of the reader or viewer have been the same for approximately 237 years. And most importantly, I tell you this story to demonstrate that even in 1781, the freedom of the press depended almost entirely on that of the owner. Hickey chose one route for his gazette, and Messing and Reed chose another. This is just another way of saying that because of our proximity to things today, because we are in the midst of 2018, because we have the phone in our pockets, we tend to think that what new India is going through today is worse than in, you know, Indira Gandhi's emergency. <coughs> that this tussle between the press and power has gone on for a very, very long time, and proprietors have been the hub around almost all of it for all of this time. We think, you know, in the, because of the proximity of things, we think that anonymity is liberating. Would you be surprised to know that almost all the exposés that Hickey did back then were based on anonymous letters and sources? Almost all the reporting. 
We think anonymity is liberating us because we can post as we feel. We think crushing dissent is new, it is not. We think filing multiple cases is new, it is not. We think an economic destruction of an offending publication is new, it is not. We think chamchagiri in the media is new, it is not. <laughs> we think appointing new editors who are close to the establishment is new, it is not. We think getting editors to do the kind of things they, they, the government of the day or the, or the company wants to do is a new thing, it's not. We think removing editors is new, it is not. We think shutting down a newspaper or shutting down an offending TV station is new, it is <coughs> not. The key difference between then and now is the wholesale capitulation that we are seeing in Indian media today. At no point in Indian history have large sections of the media felt it necessary to let the government of the hook and to hold the opposition accountable, as is happening today. At no point of time in Indian history has the media abandoned the poor, the minorities, and the marginalized as now. At no point of time has the media manufactured con consent for the most harebrained regressive actions of the government as now. And at no point of time, Indian media has been a megaphone for the majoritarian mob as now. That is the key difference between Hickey's 1780 and 2018. There is one other key difference, and that is that James Hickey suffered as a pioneer. There was no other media, at least not much media, to take up his cause. What is happening in India today is despite an oversupply of media. In fact, you could argue that it's because of this oversupply of media that all of this is happening. And it's happening despite the presence of unions, associations, guilds, and various industry bodies. And it is happening despite the size and reach and power of the media, which has grown manifold from 1780. For that reason, the key cause is ownership and the changing ownership of media in this country. In the 167 years from Hickey to the time of independence, we may have forgotten James Hickey, but he's still remembered in Calcutta. This is a street you will find outside the Great Eastern, outside the Great, Great Eastern Hotel, which is now called Hotel Lalit something. And uh, this is outside, us, uh, uh, outside that hotel. Anyway, the short point is that in the 167 years after Hickey's publication, 120 periodicals were published in this country. Most of them were owned by Englishmen, Indians, and missionaries. For example, the first Kannada newspaper ever published was published, a, was published by a missionary in Mangalore. It was called Mangaluru Varte, published by a man called Herman Mowgli. But anyway, the, the British published mostly English newspapers. The indigenous newspapers were smaller, launched by academics, intellectuals, and freedom fighters. The cause almost always was British imperialism and how to counter it, or how to, counter, how to counter, counter missionary propaganda in the state. Money was barely ever the cause or the ideology or the central objective behind most of the publications that made their way up until 1947. In fact, in 1857, a newspaper, an Urdu newspaper and a Punjabi newspaper called Payam -e Azadi was actually confiscated because it asked the people to rise up against the British. Malayala Manorama has the record of being one of the few newspapers in this country to have never had labor trouble in this country. But for nine years between 1938 and 47, the Malayala Manorama newspaper, owned by a family which, is, you know, which has been in the you know, uh, newspaper business for a long time, for nine years, the Manorama newspaper was shut down because it demanded an independent state of Travancore. So, so basically, the point I'm trying to make is that newspapers up until 1947 had many great objectives, but money was not the first of those. In fact, the first editorial, believe it or not, of the Manorama in 1888, in 1888, was education, free education for the untouchables. Imagine, 1781, James Hickey talks about masturbation for women. James Hickey talks about that. And in 1888, Banorama is talking, for free, uh, talking about free education for the untouchables. So essentially, the, the, the objectives that were driving newspapers up until 1947 was largely uh, ideological 
and largely non-commercial. It's even after 1947, for much of the time, for at least for the next 25, 30 years, spreading the message of independence became the key, key objective of newspapers, although newspapers by that time had become a financial asset. Benevolent and patriotic families and businessmen who owned other things, other products, other, other industries got into the newspaper business. Bottom line was not the objective as they could always depend on the reserves. For example, there's a very fine story that Dinesh Amin Mattu, the former media advisor to Chief Minister Sidramaya, recounts last week. He spoke of K. N. Guruswami, the man who founded the Deccan Herald and Prajawani newspaper in Bangalore. You know, Dinesh Amin Mattu writes a lovely little note about the public spiritedness of K. N. Guruswami, who was actually in the liquor business and starts a newspaper and two newspapers to serve the public cause, although he had no idea of newspapers. In fact, Mr. Mattu talks about the salaries of employees actually smelling of liquor because the notes came from the, from the, from the you know, excise contractor. So it's such a lovely piece because it talks of the public spirit, the public sphere that a liquor contractor occupies and has occupied for the last 70 years. So therefore, the short point I'm trying to make is that for much of the, uh, for, for at least 25, 30 years after the, after the independence, owners got into this for the pride, the prestige, the esteem, the, the status that newspapers gave them because newspapers then as now were very capital int intensive, they had long gestation periods and they had very low return of capital. Despite that, a lot of businessmen got into newspapers despite the shortage of newsprint, despite a whole lot of legislations. You know, there was something called the Page Price Ratio Act, there was a newsprint control order, et cetera, et cetera. All of these things were done by the post-independent governments to control the media. And yet, so many of our you know, benevolent newspaper owners started newspapers and magazines because it brought them influence, power, stature, esteem, prestige, et cetera, et cetera. Robin Jeffrey is one of the world's great media scholars. And one of his fine books on India is really, uh, is on India in which he talks, you know, uh, this is a book, it's called India's Newspaper Revolution. This is a famous book worth buying if you have not seen it. It's a wonderful read. Robin Jeffrey talks of this transformation of the media owner in India. And he says that there were three points. At one point, they were nationalists. Another point, they were traders. And at a third point, they became capitalists. Nationalists, traders, capitalists. Nationalists were the dudes who fought for independence, wanted India free, wanted, stood for a lot of things. The traders were all these banias who got into the process, you know, northeast, west, south, all most of these Agarwals, Marwadis, and so on and so forth, the Guru Swamis of the world who got into it. And eventually, the transformation from the nationalist to the trader to the capitalist is now complete. So if you had to look at the three milestones at which the owner-editor relationship has changed in this country, you can zero in on three dates. You can zero in on 1947, when we became free. You can zero in on 1977, when actually the, the emergency ended and the new government started, which set off a whole set of reforms. And you can eventually peg it down to about 95, 96, 97, which is when the fruits of liberalization started flowing down to our, you know, to our, to our owners and so on and so forth. In 2018, from the nationalist to the trader to the capitalist, I think the one key factor that has kicked in now is Hindutva. Hindutva, in my mind, has really changed the paradigm in this country in terms of owners and editors and the crowd. At this point of time, owners have a tighter stranglehold over publications and TV stations than ever before. There, are increasing, there is increasing concentration of ownership. There are higher levels of manipulation of news to suit the owner's interests. There's a general downgrading of editorial content and dumbing down. And there's a whole lot of tailoring of editorial products to suit advertiser interests. So therefore, the results of this transformation from the nationalist to the trader to the capitalist and to this Hindutvaist is now complete. And this is beginning to affect virtually every stream of the media. A trust like the, a trust like the Ch Ch Tribune in Chandigarh is not immune. It has just changed its editor. A newspaper which is owned by a family like the Dainik Jagran can happily violate the election code 
and its chairman can be named as you know director of uh, IIM Amritsar. Uh, I think uh, Sanjay Gupta has been named uh, IIM director. A group like the RP Goenka group, a part of it, can happily interview uh, the finance minister on budget day and then get posted as director of IIM Calcutta. A group like the Anand Bazar Patrika can happily chase away three or four or five journalists because uh, they were sent the requisite signals. A group like Z can fabricate news and videos and yet uh, the chairman's book can be released in the prime minister's own house. The chairman of the group can be given a Rajya Sabha seat with fake ink. <laughs> the chairman of India TV can well be made the chairman of Delhi and Delhi District Cricket Association. Times of India can well afford to uh, sack people because somebody did not come for the Economic Times Global Summit because of stories written. Uh, Prasar Bharti, which is Lok Sabha, Rajya Sabha, uh, Doordarshan, etc., etc., can sack anchors for questioning somebody's role in the freedom movement. <coughs> Foreign establishments are not uh, immune from the pressures that we are going through, and almost. The entire media seems to have exhibited a kind of capitulation that is unthinkable if you come from the standpoint of James Hickey. The kind of uh, pressures that Indian media is going through uh, is a very, very long story, a very, very sad story, and I don't want to bore you too much. But just to let you know that just about the only statistic, the only statistic that this government has not tried to improve or has not made too much of a noise about is the fact that for three years in a row, India has fallen on the World Press Freedom Index. Three years in a row. Every other statistic, you know, we try to be number one, but it's on this very happy score that we are very happy to be uh, going downwards. Little wonder that somebody like the New York Times says that the Indian media has turned into cheerleaders for actively spinning the news to favor the government. And little wonder that we've come to such a pass. A.J. Leibling, A.J. Leibling is a famous, famous New, York, New Yorker food writer and also a foreign correspondent at one point of time, who said that the freedom of the press is guaranteed to the, the freedom of the press is guaranteed only to those who own a press. Robin Jeffrey, whom I quoted, is also said that the most practical guarantee of a free press has been a strong field of competing owners. Both those theories have been more or less disproved in, in India in various different ways. Here's one final point I'll make, which is again quoting from Robin Jeffrey. He says, in comprehending the role of owners in India's newspaper revolution, we lurch between two poles. On the one hand, we may idealize the bold and just proprietor like James Hickey, who creates a sense of the public, gives voice to people previously powerless and revolutionizes social and political relationships. On the other hand, we may see newspaper proprietors as cynical manipulators of a consumer-led, capitalist-driven process in which the crudest methods bring the choicest rewards. I doubt whether there was ever a golden age when enlightened proprietors spent their fortunes to improve newspapers. The diverse and constantly changing landscape of newspapers means that between the two extremes, newspaper owners perform many functions at once. They all have ends to serve, to make a profit, to propagate a philosophy, to pamper an ego. And I say this finally because I believe, uh, and I've spoken about this very many places, I believe Indian news media today is in its very worst spot and is now engaged in what Noam Chomsky said long time back in manufacturing consent. Because I believe the greatest stories of the day 
especially in South India, are unreported. Whether it is the whether it's the death of a judge, whether it is the rise of the assets of a party president's <coughs> son, whether it's an aircraft deal, whether it's a triple talaq, whether it's Pakistan and Muslims, I think Indian media has capitulated in a manner in which it's manufacturing consent, which is extremely dangerous for our democracy. We may all have reservations about many things, but I think on the core issues, we can't disagree too much. I think much of this is also happening because the state, which is the government, is one of the top advertisers in this country. So therefore, you will not find a single newspaper asking why any government has to spend 4,880 crore rupees over 48 months to promote itself. 4,880 crores. In the first press commission report of 1953, there was a 60 to 40, 60 40 ratio in terms of advertising in most newspapers. That's what the first press commission reported. Today, it's about 10 to 15 percent. The media dependence has really had shifted in these last 70 years from owners to circulation revenue to advertising revenue. And now, in this day and age, they are willy nilly almost entirely dependent on the owners to survive. Another top media academic, George Brock, spoke of four functions for the media. He spoke of verification, sense making, witnessing, and investigation. As you sit here, it's for you to wonder as to how many of these four functions your newspaper is fulfilling. How many of your uh, TV stations are fulfilling these four functions? I might sound cynical, but let me start the way I end the way I started. I started with Hickey's story to show you that nothing has changed in 237 years. And let me end with a quote to substantiate my point. And that quote is this. Journalism in India was once a profession. It has now become a trade. It has no more function than the manufacture of soap. It does not regard itself as the responsible advisor of the public. Guess who said this and when? This was Baba Sahib Ambedkar in 1943. So the more the things change, the more they remain the same. Again, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, 1942. Indian journalism today is written by the drummer boys who glorify their heroes. Never has the interest of a country been sacrificed to, sens for, to, senselessly, to senselessly aid hero worship, which is my core point, which is that the more things change, the more they remain the same, whether you're an owner, an editor, or part of the crowd. That's my talk. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so KP, uh, you began with the concept of the ideal newspaper, what it should be, uh, what Hickey's Gazette set out to be. In today's language, that would be the concept of the, uh, let's say, Pradhan Mantri, Adarsh, Akbar, Yojana. Volume? Volume? Uh, volume? Started. Okay. Uh, yes, ah, thank you. Yeah, so, <laughs> there's one thing that strikes me is, uh, you were also talking about media ownership, the shifting hands and stuff like that. The first real newspaper job or full-time newspaper job I had was with the Indian Post, which was the Singhanias. Open secret that uh, the Singhanias started a newspaper only because they were getting slammed by Nasli Wadia and the Indian Express. Uh, the first time we worked together, Sunday Observer, owned at the time by Anil Lambani. Again, corporate ownership of the media, right? Uh, <coughs> Two of my first three jobs were in newspapers that were owned by corporate interests. I don't ever recall an instance where this became uh, an issue, where this became something that, that the, the, the fact of ownership did not even percolate to the editorial room. 
Um, I don't know what your experience has been in Sunday Observe. I mean, we work together there. So, question is this: What has changed today that the same, the same problem, for want of a better word, corporate ownership of the media, is, however, resulting in the uh, in a situation where, as you pointed out with a series of examples, we are deliberately obfuscating what should be covered, we're deliberately avoiding covering the stories that we should cover, and and we are engaged pretty much in a smoke and mirrors game where we just make a lot of, uh, I think th any, anyone who studied uh, natural history, you've heard of the squid. When it feels threatened, it, it uh, ejects a lot of black ink. Uh, into the water and, and the enemies basically get blinded. Uh, that's pretty much the role of the media today. But what was that tipping point? What changed? What has made corporate ownership of the media toxic today in a way that it wasn't before? I think a whole set of circumstances. Uh, <coughs> I think the kind of owners has changed. Uh, the kind of owners who are in charge of media has changed. As we discussed earlier, the trans the, the, the transgression uh, actually the, the 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 line of access from nationalist to trader to capitalist has undergone a change. The advertising scenario has undergone a change. But most importantly, the nature of ownership seems to have changed where a whole new set of proactive owners are in charge of publications, you know, either as editors or as behind the scenes owners. One. Secondly, the kind of people in power has changed. You know, I'm sure when we were in journalism in all of those newspapers, there were pressures. But I think there's a more insidious level of danger that is at play in this current milieu. I can tell you, uh, without quoting names, I can tell you of phone calls which are made directly f to the owners, of threats to bring down business empires, of, of, of all kinds of signals which are sent essentially to pull them in line. The thing is that most of these corporates own a whole set of different industries, you know, which are bigger, larger, uh, more profitable than the media publications that they own, newspapers or TV or magazines or whatever. So I think they are all in, you know, kind of beholden in some way to protect those empires, and that's why owners are behaving in, in a very different fashion than ever before. The, the insidious threats, the intimidation, the physical threats, the snooping uh, is of an extremely high order. It's shocking, you know. Uh, you know, it, it's 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 become very common to say that you know this is worse than the emergency. Actually, it is. The emergency, you know, we were all too young. At least I was certainly young for that time. Was at least a formally declared, bravely declared, presidential proclamation. There was a start date to that emergency. There was an end date to that emergency. People knew there was an emergency. What you now have is an undeclared emergency, which is 24-7 on. So I think the threats are different. Yeah, yeah. We're talking of that. So therefore, I think there's a whole new set of factors at play. And I think the methods of operation have become very different, both for government and for p publishers. And this is not just about any one government or any one party. You know, you have a lot of mini governments of different kinds in the various states which are all behaving in the same fashion. And they don't necessarily belong to the BJP or Congress or Trinamool or AID. You know, every single party seems to have found a way of reigning in the media. And I think that is the key factor. So um, we talked to the media, we talked to the owners. It occurs to me that this, uh, you put in the crowds into that thing. And we haven't brought the crowd in yet. so. Maybe this is a good time to do that. Uh, question is this. I, again, like you, I end up uh, having to talk to people about the media, the state of the media. It's, it's, it's now become, we're talking more of the media, uh, more about the media than, you know, pretty much any other subject today. There seems to be a sort of disconnect between two different streams of thought. One is that I get this argument that the media should operate like any other business in the sense that, you know, editors sit in these privileged positions, expect to be paid, expect uh, huge budgets for their storytelling um, uh, operations and stuff like that, but do not feel responsibility to, uh, say, own up to 
dropping circulation, dropping revenues, all of that. So editors feel the need to be protected. The media will not allow itself to be looked on as an industry with, with all the bottom line pressures that an industry faces. At the same time, the consumer believes that the media is there to fulfill a, a, a larger social function or a public function. Uh, you use the word safeguard of democracy. The two are dichotomous. You can either be an industry with a focus on making money, or you can be a public servant, uh, Pradhan Sevak, uh, whatever. Uh, where do they get, the, anyway? Um, sorry. Pradhan Sevak, you want translated? Narendra Modi. Uh, sorry. Uh, Ah, that way, sorry, um, yeah. <laughs> no, the question is, somewhere between the way, where is that wire media? At some point, we're going to have to solve for this because at, at the rate that we're going, we are on a butter slide and there is no place but further down, right? Uh, even assuming a change in government, this thing is not going to change. The media ownership is pretty much established now. It's getting more and more concentrated. You see no reversal. No, so where I, are we going? No, I think it will be very unfair to club all owners, all groups in Fair the enough. same basket. I think there are very many fine newspaper groups, very many fine organizations, but they're working under tremendous commercial and other pressures. I don't think we should underplay the fact that Indian newspapers in 1947 sold 25, million, 25 lakh copies in this country. 25 lakh copies in 1947. In 2016, they were selling about 400 million copies. So I think there has been a whole set of factors at play, literacy, technology, et cetera, which have helped this growth. And that's all because of owners who have been invested in this, in this business. Where India suffers and differs from other countries, especially the United States, is that most of these establishments are, are, are run by individuals. 90% of India's newspapers, there are about you know, let's say theoretically about 30,000 publications, 90% of those are run by individuals. There are very few listed companies which can respond to shareholder interest and so on and so forth. So what is happening is that it's all in the basket of the owner, one. Secondly, there's such a huge difference. You go to the United States, you go to any city, any college, any state, they all look up to the New York Times and say, we want to be the New York Times. We want to set a higher bar. It's only in this country that everybody looks down and says, I want to be that leader. You know, whichever one, you can choose your leader. Okay? So I think, I think that's the key difference, which is that there's no dichotomy here. The New York Times is a popular newspaper. It gets more money through subscription revenue than advertising revenue. It, it is, it's, it's profitable on its own online, and yet it responds to a, to a higher objective. For example, last Sunday, an eight-page investigation of Donald Trump's taxes, okay? So therefore, it's not dichotomous that you serve the public interest and yet be profitable and yet be, you know, uh, bringing the powerful to book. I think it's all very much in the possible. I think in the quest, in this transformation from trader to capitalist, we seem to have abandoned the public spirit to an extent that nothing else matters but the bottom line. And I think which is why most of these serious stories do not find the kind of play that they should play. So I find no dichotomy in being a profitable venture and yet being having, having some kind of a public spirit in the public space, in the public sphere. It's all very much in the possible. I think the issue here is a lot more complicated in, than in most countries because of the variety of languages and so on. But I think we've just abandoned that, that public spirit which is required for newspapers as we discussed in the case of Guru Swami of the Deccan Herald Group or you know, you can mention a few, you know, Statesman for example, the Times of India for example, you know. In fact, to the credit of the owners, most of the family owned newspapers have, have some kind of investment which is far <coughs> greater to the public spirit than other corporations. So I think there's much to be said even on the other side, but so I don't find any dichotomy at all. But do you see, uh, you did paint a fairly dire picture when you were talking about, uh, once you're done with history and you, you started talking about the present. Uh, where, do you be, where do you think, you again, I mean, we, we constantly reference the emergency, one of the things, uh, being slightly older than you, 
uh, I was in my late teens at that time, uh, one of the things I do remember was there was concerted resistance. Yeah, there were people who sort of, uh, in the famous words of M.J. Akbar, I think, uh, crawled when they were merely asked to bend. Uh, huh? Advani. Ah, yeah, sorry, Advani. Uh, which is fairly ironic uh, <laughs> considering what's happening today. But the point is there was resistance and there was resistance by the uh, large media groups, uh, a lot of them. Where do you think, do you see any form of resistance being possible today? Do you see it emerging? You see more and more people who have been, uh, who have been doing some degree of cutting edge accountability journalism being forced out of the business. So where does that leave us? Where does, where does resistance begin and how? No, I don't think uh, we're going to see any kind of resistance from the mainstream media, from the large players. You know, we all get so caught up in English language newspapers. Let's not forget that this is a drop in the ocean. If you look at the languages across the country, whether it's Hindi, Malayalam, Kannada, Tamil, Telugu, Bengali, it's a, it's a desert out there in terms of public spirit journalism. In terms, I'm, I'm not talking of you know, telling you that the sun rose in the east and set in the west. That is not news. News is what, is what is really something else. And if you look at all of these publications and channels and so on and so forth, it's a barren desert out there and frankly it's shocking. You know, the in, you know, most of our newspaper columns are translated. How ridiculous is that? So, I mean, forget investigation of corruption. You know, even on the bare aspects of common sense journalism, Indian journalism is a really poor spot. You know, translated, soulless, uh, it's got no spirit, it's not got any spunk. You know, so therefore it's a very depressing scenario across the board. At least the English language publications still have something left. The, the language publications have great circulation, great reach and great power. And it's really sad to see the abdication of the responsibilities as we speak. So basically what KP is saying is that uh, today we are screwed. There's no possibility of being unscrewed in the near future. <laughs> uh, it's not a happy thought uh, for journalists. But here's the thing. Uh, KP mentioned the, the financial pressures and uh, for people who are not from the industry, uh, here's a little bit of context. One of the things that has been happening recently is that uh, earlier your advertising dollars were fairly split between the newspaper initially followed by television, then it television leapfrogged the newspaper industry. Uh, about 60% of it went to television, 40% to uh, print and various other forms. The arrival of digital has skewed the entire economics in this fashion. The audience is moving digital. The advertising dollar is not moving digital, uh, which is one of the single biggest problems that the uh, new media basically has. The money is not following the reader, which is completely counterintuitive. Uh, today's split is something on the lines of about 50, 55% still going to television, about 30% going towards print and various other uh, form, non-digital forms, and about 15% is an optimistic estimate going towards digital. Which basically, uh, which, which brings up the question of, we've been talking about the ownership of print and of television. What about the new media ownership? Uh, it seems to be following a pattern, uh, the same pattern, or am I seeing something? You know, we are certainly seeing very new forms of ownership on digital platforms. Uh, you, of course, have legacy players, which sure. means sure. newspapers and TV stations which have gone digital and therefore have publications. So you have le legacy publications on the one hand, but on the other hand, you see a whole variety of new entrepreneurs who are getting into digital operations. But again, if you counterpoise it with the United States, you see a very big difference. For example, Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, has the courage to revamp the Washington Post and come up with something, you know, a, a revamped, a re-energized re Washington Post. You see a Pierre Omidyar who started the Omidyar Network putting in money in something like the Intercept. You know, you see billionaires in the United States and in other parts of the world actually putting in money in first class publications which stand up and speak truth to power. In our country, you see a bit of tempering there. 
most billionaires are very reluctant to put in money in digital products in fact in the news business because of the variety of fears that almost all billionaires face in this country. So you're seeing a change in ownership pattern here. So people, for example, put in equal amounts of money in a certain project, you know, uh, so that no one is held, cul held culpable at the end of the day. So you're seeing very complicated forms of ownership. Of course, it's a complicated question. But I think what you're not seeing is the public spiritedness of the billionaire in the US being demonstrated here. You're seeing it anonymously, you're seeing it behind the scenes, and you're also seeing plenty of conflict of interest. For example, one of the websites you know, is, is underwritten by 10 players, yep. one of whom is Paytm, one of whom is you know, this company, that company, etc. So where on earth will you ever be able to investigate so many of those questions that are before these companies? These companies which are behind these websites have plenty of questions to answer. So I think it's a complicated question, but I think you're still at the very cusp of this whole digital thing in this country. It's still not taken off. But what you can see is great impatience. You know, owners, the Times of India is 175, 180 years old. The Hindu is 130 years old. Deccan Herald is 70 years old. They've all invested money in those legacy businesses and survived for so long and built solid editorial products. But on the other hand, you see great urgency in digital uh, products. They want to make profits before the next, you the know, uh, before yeah. you log in, log in tomorrow morning. That's unlikely to happen. And also, like like we kind of skip the CDMA generation in cell phones, we seem to have skipped the journalism generation in digital websites. So therefore, what has happened is that there's very little journalism the reporting, the gumshoe reporting that you require on digital platforms. You know, it's a whole lot of packaging, rehashing, you know, uh, capsules and so on and so forth. You don't find investigations, you don't find deep reporting, deep dives, you don't, don't find it in legacy publications and you don't find it, generally speaking, you know, there may be great exceptions, you don't find it in digital operations which are new. So I think you're seeing a complicated story slowly develop, but again the fear is that we might just skip this generation of journalism while we build these great websites. Um, yeah, I am going to do that. I was just going to say uh, we want questions from the crowd. So um, I, since we brought up the crowd, one last question. Uh, typically when you get into these kind of untenable situations, one of two things has to happen. One is you change from within because you feel the need for change. The other is you change because of because you're getting your butt kicked. Um, products that don't satisfy consumer demands, the consumer vocalizes his dissatisfaction, her dissatisfaction, and force change, or force you to go out of business. What do you think the people, the consumers of news, if they are that dissatisfied with what is happening today, are they abdicating their responsibility to some extent? By just passively consuming what is being given? How many of you watch late night debates, the prime time noise? Yeah, well, but yeah. I'm sorry, uh, I was not using the adjective so much as the name, the noun that they have given it. I <laughs> uh, do you think? Do you think at some point the consumer is going to turn against this whole thing? Can he? Can 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 that be the trigger for change? I doubt very much. I doubt very much because I think I think, you know, uh, if you speak to top newspaper executives, they'll all tell you that uh, they are really looking at the ba bottom of the barrel just now. Uh, they're all just trying to make the very best before the tide turns. And because of this whole new thing called the mobile phone, I think uh, journalism is going to have a big problem. If you look at if you look at the way parties are choosing candidates today. It's quite an amazing thing, whether it's the Congress or the BJP or any other political party, they seem to be chasing candidates, choosing candidates on the basis of the number of Facebook followers they have, yes. the number of Twitter followers they have. <laughs> what does that mean? Basically, the media is an intermediary. The media is an intermediary between the subject and the reporting and the consumer. It is the one which scrutinizes, which verifies, which witnesses, which investigates. Political parties are removing the intermediary from the process and directly going to the consumer. So the more they choose this option, the more we are going to be left with really 
uh, poor journalism at the end of the day. Because what the parties are wanting, Congress or BJP or any other, is propaganda. They want something unfiltered in the pockets of consumers, in the pockets of citizens. That's very dangerous. If you, if you left it to just WhatsApp to decide your elections, I think we'll have a very poor country at the end of the day, if we have a country. And on that note, it's open to the floor. Uh, question. And uh, yeah. Son of an editor who suffered at the time of independence, I have one question. I had come prepared with a lot of questions on media, ombudsman, and all that. I'm dumbstruck with your uh, presentation. Thank you very much. My question is this How come the media has camouflaged as if they are for the common people? They are for the good people. Common people believe that media is for them. How did they come up late? You and me as an intellectual or engineer or a doctor or this thing who have been studying, we can make out. It's very transparent. But you ask an auto rickshaw driver, a milkman or an no. other person, who even person who is earning in lakhs, but he just have a look at him, he says, how have they come up late? Uh, That's my question. I'm Venkatesh Kamath. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kamath, uh, the answer to your question is in the question. Uh, they don't camouflage to the uh, point where the people are taken in. Basically, uh, their sense of camouflage is exactly that of the ostrich. They've buried their head in the sands. They have, they have sold themselves on the concept that nobody knows what they're up to. For instance, when TV channels, you have major news of national import <laughs> happening, breaks in the morning or breaks in the afternoon, and sure enough, prime time is taken up with the most trivial debate that can possibly be, uh, that their imagination can possibly conceive. They don't think that they're fooling you. Uh, and they don't care. Basically, this is it. This is, this is how the idea is not to tell you something trivial. The idea is to deflect from what is necessary. They're not fooling themselves, nor are they, uh, nor are they under the illusion that you guys are being fooled either. Sorry? Uh, no. Yeah, KP. No, I mean, you know, I might sound extremely cynical and all that, but I mean, I, I still, I bat for my people. You know, I think yeah. the media has done a tremendous job in making change possible in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, much of my cynicism stems from what I'm seeing and I've personally experienced uh, in the last few years. So I think we need to keep the two separate. I think the media has plenty, plenty to be proud of. They've brought some of the most amazing legislation possible. They've brought some of the most amazing issues to the attention of the world. So I don't think we can run away from those things. We are not fooling anybody. We're actually doing a great job of that. I think there's been a tremendous change in these last 60, 70 months, you know, and, and, and I think it does not take any genius to say this, but I think you can see that change, you know, whether it's the trivialization of debates, where it, uh, whether it's the kind of polarization you see on television, where people are set against each other on the basis of language, food, prayer, you know, uh, nationality. You know, I think I think all of these things are they are not fooling anybody. You know, I think I think uh, I think uh, the media may think they are fooling somebody. The kind of people who are doing these things, but I think the people are smarter than the media. I mean, you look at state after state, whether it's Bihar, whether it's you know Delhi, whether it's Karnataka, whether it's Gujarat. I think people are able to see through this despite the media. So I think the media has abdicated its role in a way in which it does not matter because people are using their common sense to do these things. So I, I doff my hat to the media for a, what it's done for the larger part of its life, but I'm extremely troubled by what it's done in the last 60, 70 months, you know, and I think, I think that's very dangerous. Hi, good evening, my name is Minakshi. I have two questions. First is about the New York Times, what you quoted about the tax uh, reporting. So do you think if the government or the president interferes, then there can be some problems? Or is there, are there any other countries other than New York uh, which you quoted are uh, good and uh, what do you call uh, ethical? And in India, why is it regional publications are been uh, are still able to, you know, be genuine? Compared to that? The first question, the first question is a very simple answer. 
the american constitution was was uh, promulgated on july 4th 1776 on the next day july 5th 1776 they passed something called the first amendment which completely protects their media from doing any of uh, from any of the pressures that india or pakistan or sri lanka or any of those countries you know face so i think the first amendment protects american media in a fashion you can't believe unless you experience it uh, no other country has that kind of freedom uh, so therefore that's the simple answer to your question uh, the the president of the united states like in other countries including ours tries very many tactics to delegitimize the media to call the media names to do a whole lot of things but he fails there uh, although he seems to succeed here secondly your question on whether the language piece is more genuine or not of course it is you know i mean much of our media is genuine you know why is lobby interfered by the complex activities oh it's very much happening you know i mean don't even be surprised if i told people you, get killed you know people are getting killed uh, there are kidnappings there are attacks there are tax raids there are all kinds of things i mean it's not just that any one government is doing this this seems to be happening across the board across states and that is truly troubling it's not as if any one political party is doing this or one ideology you know most chief ministers today seem to be able to conduct their affairs not from the chief minister's office but from the chief minister's residence one two most of them believe they don't need to give an interview to anybody you know so it's not just the prime minister of india who does not give an interview most chief ministers do not okay so the so don't at all think that language media is immune from these pressures they are very much exposed to these pressures uh, you know as uh, i can tell you that we seem to see so many cases of pressure but i think i think it's, it's even stevens but it's felt a lot more because just like in 47 or 77 or 97 the english media despite its size has a disproportionate influence on our discourse okay so therefore you might hear of it more uh, but don't at all think that it's not happening I just sort of since you mentioned the first amendment um I just sort of want to point out one other factor that maybe this discussion could be added to uh I think one of the things we can't take into or can't miss is the role of other institutions in the current state of the media and I think one of the key factors in this has been that the judiciary no longer seems to be important um in the US and forget about freedom of speech at large in the US there is enough institutional independence to know that for a jeff bezos you can't shut me down tomorrow if i say something in the washington post that president trump doesn't like uh in indian media it's probably you go you take a 50 50 shot you think maybe they can maybe they can't um some who want to take that risk will do it but a bulk will equally know i don't i can't i can't count on the support of not just the judiciary but you know maybe the police or even the states because there is a multi I completely agree with that. I mean, you know, when we speak of the media's pressures, we are just doing that because of this context. I mean, you know, if you look at the industry bodies, when I say industry bodies, I'm saying, you know, FICI or CII. You know, if you look at the kind of statements they make, uh, they're all tempered, they're all held back. You know, so you can see whether it's the judiciary, whether it's the IAS association. You know, if if you remember the the Delhi government's. Uh, you know tussle with the bureaucracy there you know if you look at that if you look at the ips association in delhi all of these associations are functioning under tremendous strain you know and so i think the institutional support that the united states has uh, we don't have i don't think the media certainly has i don't think our media bodies have the strength the spine to stand up for almost anything anymore you know so i am not at all surprised and i completely am with you you know we don't have that institutional support yes standing talk one main question do you think that in the media the t- 
TV, advent of TV's dominance has actually created a situation of huge manipulation of people, of news, post-truths, etc., compared to the newspaper. Well, the shortest answer I can give you is yes. <laughs> it's the shortest answer, and it's you know. I, in fact, when I said that the three signposts of Indian uh, media is 47, 77, and 97. 97 is also yeah. largely because of the advent of satellite television, which has changed the rules of the game. You know, satellite TV in terms of news television came in 1993, and I think it's been part of the process. So I don't think you can lay the blame on any one factor, but certainly newspapers are are a cut above the rest. You cannot mention the word TV journalism in the same sentence, actually, you know, in my book. But, uh, but uh, there is nothing called TV journalism that you see of any substantive character in this country, you know, except for small pockets. You know. And again, it's so troubling if you know a few languages, when you look at the language television scenario, it's pathetic beyond belief. You know, uh, I'm not talking of uh, television serials, which are horrendous, <laughs> but I'm just, I'm just talking of just news television. You know, uh, there are just pockets, you know, tiny specks in this vast ocean where you can see some sense. And television, at the end of the day, is mass medium. You know, it's a mass medium. It touches everybody. So I think you know we are. You know, I mean, it's such a depressing scenario, media-wise. But television really takes the the bakery. Uh, since you're looking at uh, factors, there's one other that you might want to consider. Back in the day when you had newspapers, they dug for news actively. They, they put feet on the ground. They went looking for news. They reported the news. Television came in uh, and it became sound bites. Uh, just, just stick a mic in somebody's uh, face. You get a response. That's a response. You don't get a response. The anchor can go half an hour on why the person didn't respond. Uh, no, it happens. I mean, but uh, a third element has been added, which is social media. So now, social media used to be, you did a story and then you propagated it on social media. Today, you have editors who monitor social media to see what people are talking about. So that becomes a story tomorrow. It's, it's really, you're now chasing your tail. And yeah, so that's adding to what KP was talking about. Television doesn't do news and now Increasingly, digital media is, yeah. The picture is stronger than a thousand words, and I think that's what's being utilized. To well, it isn't. I mean, you, uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, I remember a television program where a person didn't come out of the house. Yeah. And for about half an hour, the camera was focused on that person's front window. The curtain is moving. He is behind that curtain, but he's not coming out. What? I mean, how is that worth a thousand words? It's not worth a single minute of anybody's time. So, yeah, done right it is. Question is whether it's being done right, and like KP but said, no. Also, will be waiting for the who will be waiting what's happening? You changed the channels. You said it yourself. Yeah. How long are you going to see somebody's window? Uh, can I? Uh, can I ask this question? Uh, uh, Mr. Krishna Prasad, you had mentioned that there are some owners and groups that uh, are still sort of resisting all these pressures. And can you name three or four groups that perhaps are standing up to the pressure? You know, I mean, uh, there are far, m far more than four groups I can name. For example, uh, in very different ways, the Anand Bazar Patrika group has done a good job. Uh, especially with their English newspaper, their Hindi TV station. You see, many of them are playing different numbers in the same you know, album. You know? So the Hindi news channel of ABP is the opposite of the Telegraph newspaper. The Telegraph newspaper, I can proudly look at every morning and say, my God, they have something which makes me happy. But their TV station does the opposite. That group is doing a very fine job so far, although they have sacked a whole lot of editors uh, seemingly at the government's pressure. So. You could name them. You could name, in some ways, the Times of India group itself was standing up in many different ways because the Times of India is a very strong newspaper financially and, and, and in terms of reach. So they cannot be uh, opposed, uh, or cannot be dictated to beyond a point. In their own way, they are doing a great job. In their own way, you could say uh, Deccan Herald and Pajamani are doing a 
fairly reasonable job of the of 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 of, of resisting not just pressure but you know in 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 putting something back into journalism you know my core point is not about resistance my core point is about journalism and i think many groups are doing a fine job or trying to do a fine job you know yeah i don't know how many of you are aware of a newspaper called punjab kesari okay. you know uh, punjab kesari <coughs> lost 60 people 60 people died during the khalistan movement because the punjab kesari opposed the khalistan movement 60 of its employees including its owner and his son were assassinated you know <coughs> why am i saying that i am not saying that because of resistance because they still try to do some journalism despite the extraordinary pressures and i think there are many groups like that which in ways small or big are trying to do some journalism but journalism cannot just come out of hope and you know uh, thin air you know you need the commerces you need the money you need to balance so many of these things that are required you know and as robin jeffrey tells you the owner is a kind of a conduit between i mean not just a conduit a kind of a, a a hub around the reader the advertiser and the people in power you know the owner needs to keep all these three happy and interested in their product so i believe that more than three groups or more than 10 five groups are trying to do these things and trying to keep the ship afloat in a reasonable sort of way my problem is with the journalism you know so that is my core point rather than just the 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 content rather uh oh by the way if you want an antidote to all the depression lots of them but i'll give you one the caravans reporting of judge lawyer's death the only uh, media house that consistently reported that feet on the ground beautiful forensic reporting they did what investigative agencies should do and it is brilliant uh we have time for one more question who's got the mic uh, certainly not from the government <laughs> uh, certainly from the underworld in different sorts of ways uh, there was uh, an enormous pressure from the underworld uh, but certainly not the government oh i mean physically alive so it's fine you know but i mean you do take some measures so you take I mean, I mean it's a cliche to mention the underworld but I'm sorry to have mentioned it but you know I mean you do take some steps to secure yourself and that's a that's a that's a fear not just me but many journalists go through for various stories you know I mean we to, we are in great cities like Bombay Bangalore Delhi etc I mean there are people in Chhattisgarh in Raipur in Bastar and you know and Jharkhand and you know Maharashtra Chandrapur etc etc you know they work under tremendous pressure you know i mean uh, physical threats people stoning your house you know i mean in the middle of the night a single girl out on a reporting assignment your hotel is attacked you know so these pressures are nothing compared to the pressures these people face on the ground you look at Kashmir it's a minefield to report Shujaat Bukhari my friend got assassinated about 5 6 months ago you know and we still have no word my own fine friend Gauri Lankesh killed at her doorstep you know what is our pressure compared to theirs so therefore this business is a really different business unlike what we might think as consumers and as citizens this is a very tough business and uh, and and people have paid with their lives and our pressures are nothing uh somebody on the way here i was i was meeting a friend uh, earlier today and they were asking uh, in a different context why some of these stories are not really reported uh, when they happen and what kp said reminded me of this dera sacha sauda the rape case it was reported by a local uh, reporter back in the day 10 years or so before the story actually hit the uh, front page of uh, the national media and uh three days after he filed the report somebody landed up at his doorstep as he was stepping out shot him dead right in front of his house uh so yeah so you were talking about consumer demand and i just want to end with what is the role of the consumer the reader if readers are not prepared to pay more than 5 bucks and what can you really get for 5 rupees right it's you can't even get a cup of tea now uh that you you should want to one want good journalism and you should be ready to pay for it that role if you would like to comment on that 
Well, uh, KP made the point, for instance, about the New York Times uh, now becoming profitable. The New York Times is not the only one. The Washington Post, which has been investing tremendously in in uh, hiring good journalists and, and deepening beats and stuff like that, they're profitable because people are actually paying for it. Uh, the Financial Times, which turned f full digital or digital first, they've become profitable the last two years. There are media houses that are becoming profitable. All of them have one thing in common, uh, which is that there is a tremendous amount of focus on actually doing what reporting is supposed to be about. And that is bringing the audience to the uh, thing. So, so yeah, I mean, you, pardon? In India, well, I mean, somebody needs to try. Uh, some people are to a small extent, but then uh, you know it's again like KP uh, said the the finances are a complicated question. We'd be here all night. Uh, it's not that it's impossible. It is that right now we're going through a through a period where it just doesn't seem as easy as one two three. So yeah, somebody needs to put money on the table and say, okay, I've got your back, and you will see journalism coming back. We've. <coughs> We've spent much of this evening talking about how journalism is failing us. I know that KP vacillates. On the one hand, <coughs> he thinks there are journal there's a level of journalism that is working very well for us, but he also thinks that we are being failed. And the interesting thing is <coughs> that all of us here are aware of this. Now the question therefore is, if we are aware of this, how are we going to put this awareness to work? Are we going to be able to get, give journalists the kind of freedom, the kind of security, the kind of safety they need that poor Gauri Lankesh didn't have? Are we going to be able to do that? Or in the end, is the politician going to have his way? question to think about. And to be honest, I'm not sure what to make of that. If I had to, at this point, say what I think is likely to happen, to use your phrase, I think we're screwed. We're not going to be unschooled very soon. And that is yours, I think. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please, a big hand to our speaker for today. I'd like to make, I'd, I'd like to also convey our thanks because this event is in collaboration with Citizen Matters. This is an online publication and with Co Media Lab. We're very fortunate there are many such institutions that come to us and want to collaborate to do things like this. So thank you to the two of them and thank you to all of you for staying on as late as you have. Thank you. <laughs>